thankful, focused, and purposeful. The reason being, and as we'll go through this, uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, you're going to see that the people are extremely thankful to God for all that he has done, for his watch care, for his protection, not just at that particular moment of time, but even looking back throughout the years, that they are going to be very focused, and Solomon wants to make sure that God's people are focused on what it is that they are supposed to be about doing. What is, what is the meaning of this temple that's just been erected for God's glory? What is supposed to be their focus when all the world sees that they have built this place? And throughout the years as people come in and they try to destroy that temple because of all that it represents and not just the temple itself. And because of that, they need to be very, very purposeful. That God has something that's much bigger than just that temple in mind when he built it. So in 1 Kings chapter 8 that you have marked there, he does say that he's going to build this temple to God with the provisions that were made. But in not just building it, but in dedicating it to God. And as I said, prior to this, God had been seen as dwelling in a tent, basically, and traveling around with them. That there was not a house that was built for God to, to be in. And that this was something that David had wanted to do prior, but because David was a man of blood, he wasn't able to do it. And it was through Solomon that it was going to be built. God had something very, very specific in mind when he talked about the temple. And so what I want us to do first is to think about, so what is it about the temple, especially when you turn to places, uh, places such as in the New Testament? In John 2 and verse 19, Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And when you look at the context, you see that what Jesus is talking about is his own body. But there's no mistaking in the New Testament that it refers to Jesus as being God's temple. And we know that being part of God's temple, being in Christ, is where all the blessings are found. But also in other passages, like 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? And so God is able to make each one of us, as individuals, temples to God. And we house the Holy Spirit. And this is something that God gave to us. That is not a working of our creation. But as we know from a place like Ephesians 2 and verse 10, we are God's workmanship. We've been made a temple by God himself. So as we as individuals live these moral lives that he's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we're able to accomplish what it is that the temple is supposed to accomplish in drawing others to him and being pure. But also in other places, Ephesians 2 verses 19 through 22. Here Paul says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and members of the household of God, having, built, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And so when you look at those first two passages, you see that Ephesians combines those together, that Jesus is that cornerstone of the temple. The things that the apostles were preaching and teaching, that truth that they gave to all of mankind, was what we as living stones are being built up together as being this holy temple in which God himself dwells. And so we are today that temple of God as we're supposed to be. And so in 1 Kings chapter 8, we see the dedicating of this temple in the, in the first place. 1 Kings chapter 8, if you'll turn there. 1 Kings chapter 8. And we're going to read verses 22 through 24. This is when he begins his prayer of dedication. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel, and he spread out his hands toward heaven. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God in heaven above or on earth below like you, who keep your covenant and mercy with your servants, who walk before you with all their hearts. You have kept what you promised your servant David, my father. You have both spoken with your mouth and fulfilled it with your hand as it is this day. He understood and he knew. And when you see at the conclusion of this prayer or near the conclusion of the prayer, verse 56, Blessed be the Lord who has given the rest to his people Israel. According to all that he has promised, there, there has not failed one word of all his good promise which he promised through his servant Moses. One of the things that Solomon points out from the beginning is how thankful they should be, but not just for what they have but for what God has done to bring them to that point. That God has been with them throughout their entire journey. 
Solomon remembered that this is the promise that you made to my father David. And even at the end, he said, there is not a single promise that you have not fulfilled. He was thankful not for what God had blessed them with, but for God's faithfulness. And there's a huge difference between the two. Because if we're only thankful for the blessings, being blessed with such a wonderful place to be able to come into and worship, if we're only thankful for the blessings, then as those blessings grow old, as those blessings grow uh, faded away, then we also have our thankfulness that will decrease as well. But when we see that God is faithful throughout all of those things, it doesn't matter the circumstances that we find ourselves in or what we, we find ourselves worshiping in or the conditions in which we find ourselves worshiping. We can be thankful because God was faithful throughout all of it. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 27, as he continues, he says in verse 27, But will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, how much less this temple that I have built. In verse 30, he says, And may you hear the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. And notice this, Here in heaven your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. Solomon points out that the temple was not the actual dwelling place of God. It was never intended to be the literal dwelling place of God. But it was the place where God's representation or where God's glory was to be seen. It was where God's ideas, principles, the characteristics of God were to be exalted to the rest of the world to see. But God himself, it says, dwells in heaven. God cannot be contained by brick and mortar. God cannot be contained by an auditorium. God is not, uh, not, not limited to only a place where we come together on Sunday and Wednesdays and we pay him a visit. That is not who our God is. Our God is much greater. He is much holier. His grandeur expands throughout all the earth. Even in the New Testament, uh, there, there are sermons that are preached where it talks about God's glory and how much bigger he is than any building that might be built. In Acts chapter 7, it's interesting that in Acts chapter 7, you have Stephen. And this man who is full of faith, he's being accused of blasphemy. And one of the things that it says at the end of chapter 6 of Acts in verse 13, against Stephen it says at the end of Acts chapter 6 and verse 13, they also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words, and notice this, against this holy place and the law. And so when they confront Stephen, it's not just because he's tried to say something about the law of Moses and how it's no longer of effect. It's not that they feel like he's just talking about the ancestral fathers of the Hebrew nation and how he feels like they're, uh, he's just trying to dismiss all of them. But even against that holy place, against that temple, they believe he was blaspheming. They recognize it was supposed to be a place of holiness. And so at the end of Acts chapter 7, verses 47 through 50, but Solomon built him a house. This is one that we're reading about this morning. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, and this is from Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all of these things? God is much bigger. His glory is much greater. His expanse is more far-reaching than anything that can be contained in any type of building, even if it was a temple. And even from the very beginning, Solomon, when he was erecting this house that God himself planned, that God himself gave the direction for, that God himself had blessed them, that God had actually commanded that it be built, it was never meant to be the literal dwelling place of God. And if we confuse that today when we think about a, a, a building... If we think about just ourselves, we miss the point of what Jesus is trying to accomplish. In Acts chapter 17, verses 24 and 25. Acts 17, verses 24 and 25. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life and breath and all things. And so again, God is much bigger. His grandeur is much greater than anything that can be built. What typically happens with, with brethren that we have to be careful of as well is that we begin to define ourselves by the surroundings that we find ourselves in. That because we, we see that we've been blessed, it can, it, it can obscure who God really is. 
when Solomon was praying to God, he recognized him as being Jehovah, the great covenant keeper. He recognized him as being Elohim, the great creator of all things. He recognized him as being El Shaddai, the one who is all sufficient to provide all things for all people for all times. Solomon recognized that. But if we forget that, it can really obscure us as to who God really is. To think that only God is only in one place at one time and nothing else in life matters other than that place. Solomon also recognizes where real blessings actually come from. 1 Kings chapter 8 again in verse 14. It's interesting that a couple times in this prayer and in his, in his speech as well, in verse 14 of 1 Kings 8, then the king turned around and he blessed the whole assembly of Israel while all the assembly of Israel was standing. But notice in verse 15, verse 14 says that he blessed the whole assembly. This is how he blessed them, verse 15. And he said, blessed be who? The Lord God of Israel. Even at the end of this, if you go down to verse 55, then he stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice saying, and again he says, blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people. The greatest way and the only way to give blessings and to bless a people are to teach them about who the Lord is. It's, it's not to sit around and talk about how blessed we are and how many great blessings we have, that thankfulness that we have. That is indeed a wonderful thing that we should be reminded of constantly. But the way in which you actually bless a people is to remind them of who gave them those blessings. Not the blessings themselves, but the one who is the blessed giver. When we count our blessings, when we say our thanks, it's about who it is who gave it to us and not just about the gift itself. And so, brethren, we have been blessed and we have been given a great gift. But let us always remember who gave it to us. Let us always remember how much he has done throughout the years and the faithfulness that God has always shown to his people. So that when we give the glory of our lips, when we say our prayers, when we say our thanks, when we sing our praises, that this is something that's focusing on him and his glory throughout all times. He also reminds them in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 31 through 53, and obviously we won't have time to read all of these verses. <clears throat> but it's interesting that when Solomon is actually making this prayer to God, one had, that has had thankfulness involved in it, one that has shown the great beauty and splendor of who God is, that he actually turns in his prayer to negative things. There's several different negative things, and from a negative perspective, he talks about. Verse 31, he says, If anyone sins against his neighbor and is forced to take, it, forced to take an oath. In verse 33, when your people Israel are defeated before an enemy. In verse 35, when the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because they've sinned against you. In verse 37, when there is a famine in the land, pestilence, blight, mildew, locusts, grasshoppers, COVID-19, wait, <laughs> plague or whatever sickness. On and on he says this. Verse 40, he, 46 he says, when they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin. And then in verse 47, when they come to themselves, and at the end of verse 47, we have sinned and done wrong will be their admission. We have committed wickedness. Then in verse 49, he says, Then hear in heaven your dwelling place, and their prayer and their supplication maintain their cause. Verse 50, at the end, grant them compassion before those who take them captive, that they may have, com that you may have, com they may have compassion on them. Over and over throughout this, he points out that sin is a reality. Sin is going to occur. There's no one on the earth who doesn't sin. And Solomon doesn't hide that fact. He doesn't pretend when he prays to God that because of what you've done for us and how we've been blessed and how you've been faithful, that because of that we will never sin. We will never fall from your grace and your mercy. He admits the exact opposite. He also does not flee from the fact that we're going to be defeated by enemies. There are going to be times where it's going to seem like we have failed in ways because of sin even. There's going to be times where there's going to be hardships and difficulties. Solomon knew that this place was not a place where you could hide from troubles. That is not what the building was about. It's not what the tabernacle, the temple was ever about. A place where you can hide from those things. 
Even later, when you come to places like Jeremiah chapter 7, it seems that the people had this very idea about the temple. Jeremiah chapter 7, and verses 1 through 11. It says, Then the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate at the Lord's house, the very place where Solomon was really standing at this time. Stand in the gate at the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all of you of Judah, who enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words. The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, or walk after other gods to your hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I have given to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal and murder and commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, walk after other gods whom you do not know, and then come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say that we have been delivered to do all these abominations? Has this house which is called by my name become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, says the Lord. He says that that place can be perceived as being a place where you can hide. The troubles that are coming are going to come, whether you come here or not. Sin is a reality that you're going to have to face, whether you come here or not. And if those are the things that you've been doing outside, do not suppose that you can come through the doors and God's going to somehow ignore it just because you come through the doors. God did not deliver us, Solomon says, from all of these things just because he's built a house. You can't hide from those things. God sees them. He knows them. He holds us accountable. That this is supposed to be the kind of place when people have these things in their lives, liars, thieves, adulterers, murderers. Those kinds of people should flee from those things and come into the Lord's presence, but that they might amend their ways and not remain in them. We're supposed to be that beacon of light that tells the world, you don't have to remain that way. And if you have pestilence, if you have troubles, if you have warfare going on, there is a place where you find peace, but it's a peace that you choose to have. It's not a peace that the world may offer. It's a choice to have joy and not one that is just found within the walls of a building. And Solomon reminds them of that as well. And lastly, Solomon also reminds them to focus on what their real true purpose was all about. Back in 1 Kings chapter 8, Verses 41 through 43. In the midst of all these negative things from the negative perspective that he had been talking about, in verse 41 it says, Moreover concerning a foreigner who is not of your people Israel, but has come from, from a far country for your name's sake, for they will hear of your great name and of your strong hand and your outstretched arm when he comes and prays toward this temple. Solomon says, Hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, that all peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this temple which I have built is called by your name. The very purpose for that temple was not so that Jerusalem and Israel would have a place of worship to where they could stay to themselves and keep everyone else out, especially the foreigner who was living in ways that the Israelite was opposed to. That was not the purpose of the temple. The purpose of the temple was this, so that all the world could see how outstretched the Lord's arm is, even to the foreigner, even to the one who dwells in, in the other lands, even to the one who has been despondent and cast off by every other nation, even to everyone to the very ends of the earth. When they come to this place and God says, when they come here and they see who I am and they see the people who, who I have delivered and they see my faithfulness and that I am bigger than this place because even to the ends of the earth they've heard of me and they pray to this place, Solomon says, Lord, hear them. 
that should be our prayer constantly. Always to be reaching out to those who are around us, reaching out to those who have been cast off by every other thing in the world, who seem like foreigners to us, who seem like people that we have nothing in common with. The Lord's hand is outstretched to them all. The Lord wants each and every one of them to come here, not this building, to come into this fellowship, this dwelling place of God in the Spirit that's been built up on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ as the cornerstone, the teachings and direction of the apostles and prophets of old, to we as living stones who are constantly being built up joined and knit together by what each and every one of us bring to the body of Christ. That's what the temple is. And brethren, that's what the temple was always meant to be. God was not just interested in the building. God was interested in what he said, these people who are called by my name. That's who we are. We're the people called by his name. And we have a holy and mighty charge Throughout the New Testament, you see these types of things as well. In, in Mark chapter 11, in verse 17. Mark 11, in verse 17. Jesus, as he is cleansing the temple, he goes to Jerusalem, and he saw those who were buying and selling in the temple. They were treating it as a place of merchandise a place of commerce and a place that was established for their own benefit and purposes. Jesus says in verse 16, would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. And in verse 17, he taught them saying, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer and notice for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. It's a house of prayer for all the nations. So we are to be the ones in Mark 16, 15 and 16, just as it was the charge given to the apostles to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. That's what we're about. That's our purpose. And brethren, that's the thing that we should remain focused on. God has blessed us richly. And he has been faithful throughout all the years. And he has built for himself a holy temple. And it's not this building. It is you and I in Christ Jesus. We have a very strong and powerful God that we serve that sees all and knows all. He knows the very needs that you have this morning. And he knows the ones around you who need to hear and know the things that you've come to know. And we need to be reaching out to him, to them the same as God is reaching out with his outstretched arm. Let's pray together. Our holy and righteous Father, we are indeed thankful to you. Father, for all the blessings you've given to us throughout life, we cannot begin to enumerate. We cannot help but praise you for all that we have. But especially, Father, and we pray that we always focus upon this first and foremost because of you. You are our God. You are our Father. You are our Savior. We are a people who are called by your name. Father, we pray that each and every day we live in accordance with how you'd have us to live, that we imitate your Son, who knew what it meant to be dedicated to your purposes, to be tempted and tried in every way possible, and yet he did not yield because his heart was dedicated to things above and not the things of this world. Help us, Father, to have the same heart. We are thankful to you that you have blessed us with such a wonderful place to worship, a place where we can exalt your name. But we pray, Father, that from these walls, from this place, that we bring others to know you and what it means to be in fellowship with you and with your son, the Christ. We're grateful for the guidance that you've given to us through your holy word, that you preserved it throughout the years and shown your faithfulness in doing so, that we can know wholeheartedly what it is that you'd have us to do, that we should never have doubts or fears, Father, because you are the one who created you are the one who will destroy. But Father, in the end, you're also the one who delivers. We pray for such a day as that. We pray these things in the name of your son. Amen. The question I'm going to leave with you is this one. Is how dedicated are you to the work <clears throat> that God has given to us? More specifically, how dedicated are you to our God that we serve? There are so many people who put in work. 
and allowing for the things that, that we have. We could not, we didn't, don't have enough time to go through the list of all the people who came here throughout the week cleaning, picking things up, painting, staining, moving things around for those who stayed late at night even to past midnight to make sure that this, the sound is working and just that we have comfort to be able to worship such as this. But this is the reality. They do that because they're dedicated to God and they want us to be able to focus. Thank you for all the efforts that you put in. As one of the elders of this congregation, thank you. Thank you for being a strong flock. Thank you for the dedication and patience you've shown in accomplishing the things that God wants us to accomplish. You've been the ones who've been inviting people. You've been the ones who've been talking to others about our God and the wonderful mercy that he shows. Thank you for that, and we're humbled by those things. If you're subject to the invitation this morning, if you need to be a Christian because of the blessings that, that it provides, if you need to be rededicated and there's something that we can help you with, won't you please come as together we stand and sing.